Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming to the talk late, uh, late this evening. Uh, my name is Tyron Lovin. I work at JP Morgan. Um, I'm the product lead for a platform called Quorum. Uh, if you're not familiar with Quorum, it's effectively a fork of the Geth client that's designed for uh, operating within permissioned environments. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, really deploying Ethereum in corporate production enterprise grade environments and this idea of bringing Ethereum to enterprise. Um, and in order to just frame the conversation, what I'd like to do is talk about magnitude, not scale, uh, not scaling, uh, not talking about sharding or anything like that here. Uh, really just this, this idea of magnitude and while I'm talking about this, I would like for you to think about the opportunity that you see in front of you. And um, apol apologies in advance, uh, I work at a bank and so you're going to see a series of pie charts. So what we have here is the daily volume for the top five cryptocurrencies. Um, this is taken from a couple of days ago. And I think this is significant, you know, $22 billion worth of uh, transactions being traded in these open environments on these fairly new asset classes from a financial services perspective. And, you know, clearly, as you would expect, um, you know, Tether and Bitcoin taking up the majority with Ethereum around 4 billion transactions in terms of volume over, over that day. Um, but this is just a fraction of the daily volume of payments processed by JP Morgan um, every day. So JP Morgan processes $6 trillion worth of payments each day. And when you compare that, obviously, to the daily volume of cryptocurrencies, this is just a fraction, less than half a percent. Um, I, I thought what was interesting here when I was putting to the slide together was trying to represent the scale correctly. And clearly, the graph on the right is not uh, to scale with the one on the left. And so as an exercise for myself, I decided to try and scale it correctly. And so here we have $22.8 billion represented by this small little dot. And then, I guess, a big circle, which probably... I don't know, it takes up most of that wall if you had to extrapolate it out. So the scale and the magnitude here is, is uh, I think, quite interesting. Another data point is the fact that, you know, if we think about 2017 uh, and the height of the ICO boom, we had almost $7 billion uh, raised in this completely new financial services um, opportunity, right? This new way of raising finance in this completely open platform. And again, I think that's fascinating that we that seven billion dollars worth of of uh, debt or, or whatever you kind of classify these these tokens as uh, was raised. But again, if you compare that to more traditional finance, uh, in 2017, global IPOs raised or, or finance raised through global IPOs came in just shy of 180 billion dollars. So again, from an ICO versus IPO perspective, you know, around four percent um, was raised through IPOs through ICOs. And uh, what's even more interesting is that if you could then compare that to the global debt that was issued in 2017, uh, which came in around $3.7 uh, trillion worth of debt, even IPOs start to uh, kind of pale in comparison. So wh what, is, uh, what is the point here? Well, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when we think about permission blockchains, Really, the reason why we are currently focusing on them is because the magnitude that we are currently focusing on and trying to tackle within these traditional financial environments and corporate environments is significantly different to what we're looking at today, at least in public blockchain land. And so we need a rigorous control environment and uh, a permissioned environment to actually enable us to tackle these challenges within this traditional world. But I think the opportunity is that permission blockchains can potentially be a proving ground for a future state when th these uh, traditional financial models actually do start to move onto public blockchains, or at least enabling that in some sense. And so really, this is the reason why JP Morgan developed Quorum in the first place. And so again, uh, if you're not familiar, Quorum is an open source platform. It's uh, a fork of the Geth, in, uh, the Geth client, and it's designed for processing transactions within a, per a permissioned network. Uh, it brings strong privacy and, and controls. And if we think about what Quorum is, it's really an amalgamation of these uh, characteristics. So firstly, it's Ethereum under the hood. As I said, it brings uh, privacy to the Ethereum environment. Um, we implement permissionings, uh, a configurable consensus environment, and also we have, as a result of that, a uh, much higher performance profile than what you get on public blockchains.
And so what I'd like to do is just um, spend, spend some time talking through some of the, the architecture and design uh, of Quorum and some of the technical details. And then we'll marry that up against uh, the requirements that we see from a, an enterprise perspective and show how we're actually using Quorum to, to meet those requirements. So firstly, from a high-level design perspective, you know, Quorum is, is fairly straightforward. Um, people talk about Quorum in, in sort of conceptual terms as a, a, a combination of what is really a geth node. Um, we, we refer to it as a Quorum node, uh, which is geth plus some modifications, and a separate service uh, called Tessera, um, which is a Java implementation of the service, or Constellation, which is a Haskell implementation of the service. But really, this service is uh, uh, something that enables privacy on a permissioned network. Uh, it's made up of a transaction manager and a secure enclave. Um, and we're going to go through how these things kind of work together in a, in a little bit. But I think the important thing here is um, Quorum is really just Geth under the hood. Right now, uh, it's on Geth 1.8.12. Uh, we're looking to move to 1.8.18 soon, and then uh, we'll start to look at the Constant Constantinople up, um, upgrade. And additionally, because it's just Geth, uh, the, you know, the tools that you kind of know and love from public blockchain just work out of the box for, um, when you're dealing with uh, so-called public transactions in a, in a private network. So, you know, Truffle, Metamask, Remix, obviously all of the Open Zeppelin Solidity contracts, uh, they're all just deployable and uh, compatible directly. So one of the key things is obviously privacy, uh, and apologies, there's a lot of information on the slide here, but I'll, I'll kind of talk you through this. Um, so the, the actual, the, the primary reason why we developed Quorum was to solve for privacy. Uh, specifically from a financial services perspective, it's really important that you know, your counterparty has no visibility of your transactions. Um, you, you have to protect your balances, you have to protect your, your pricing, et cetera. And so we effectively have a hybrid privacy design uh, we have two uh, components that enable privacy. So uh, the first one is this Tessera and Constellation service that I, that I was mentioning. Uh, this is the primary privacy service within Quorum. And what it enables is um, the point-to-point -point communication of private data. So private data is, is communicated directly between, uh, for example, Tessera nodes. And there's no global distribution of that private um, data on the blockchain. What is globally distributed, however, is a hash of the encrypted version of that data. And, and important here, it's, it's not the encrypted data that's globally distributed, it's a hash of the encrypted data. So we're never actually storing encrypted data uh, on the blockchain. Uh, the way that we actually uh, went about achieving this was through a couple of modifications. Uh, firstly, we introduced a new um, attribute onto the transaction model. Uh, so uh, there's, a there's an attribute called private4, which is effectively an array that you can pass in a list of addresses that you want to send your private uh, data to. So you can send, uh, you know, these three counterparties should be receiving this information. You put their public keys uh, in this uh, array, and then Quorum will effectively ensure that distribution happens in a point-to-point -point fashion. We also split the state tree. So uh, in Quorum, you have a public state tree and a private state tree. A uh, public state tree is the same across all quorum nodes, and then a private state tree contains just the data that's relevant to you. Uh, again, importantly, no encrypted data on chain, and through uh, uh, kind of architecting your application, you can actually use this model to ensure things like uh, prevention of double spend in a token, in a token environment. But um, there are some limitations, and so what we did was augment that with a zero-knowledge proofs implementation. So in 2017, we worked with the Zcash company uh, to effectively enable uh, fully private tokens on a quorum environment. And so this does actually give you a, uh, a situation where you can have you know, conservation of the total money supply, uh, as well as prevention of double spend in a, in a private manner. This is the proof of concept only, but through this year, we're going to be looking to actually uh, uh, industrialize that and productionize it. But the, the idea here is that these two components uh, really are compatible and, and work together quite nicely, supporting various use cases. And so when we look at the entire solution, uh, Quorum really has a, a quite a unique and novel approach to privacy. So firstly, there's no dependency on any third party uh, application or external, uh, ex external service. There's also no single point of failure. So there's no special nodes, there's no special components and we have the ability to integrate with new cryptographic schemes as well. 
We ensure that we meet various uh, regulatory requirements. So when we developed Quorum, it was developed with this idea of knowing what our, our regulatory requirements were around management of data. And so again, as I was saying earlier, data is only transmitted in a point-to-point -point fashion. And so you're always aware of where your data is, and this enables you to actually meet local uh, you know, data compliance laws. And then finally, we have a, a strong notion of security in this model because every transaction uh, is actually visible directly on the chain by all nodes, but only in the, the only the hash of that data is visible. And so what you effectively have is every node witnessing a transaction has occurred, but doesn't have any visibility of what that transaction is, is about. And so what this enables you to do is effectively you know, present that hash to anyone else in the network and say, please, can you guarantee or, or confirm the fact that I, I held this data and nothing has been changed uh, on, the, on the network at all. And overall, what this gives us is this notion of decentralized privacy. And so just as a, a kind of high-level schematic of what a quorum network looks like, again, every node on the network is the same. Uh, every, every node is running the same protocol. Every node has exactly the same blockchain. There is only one blockchain. There's not a, a, a set of bilateral blockchains. And the only thing that really differs is the fact that you have these divergent uh, state trees. So that's privacy. Uh, another important piece when we think about enterprises is uh, permissioning. It's important that corporates know who they're transacting with, know who they're doing business with. There are strong know your customer rules that uh, many organizations have to uh, comply with. And so we have multiple uh, implementations or ways of actually achieving permissioning within the quorum environment. So the first one is that we have node level permissions. This is effectively a configuration file on every node that allows you to determine which other nodes you can actually accept requests from and make uh, uh, connection requests to. And coming in April, we're also implementing a smart contract-based permissionings model. So this is really enabling a fully decentralized view of the permissions model where every node on the network is guaranteed to be following the same rules in terms of how other entities are actually permissioned onto the blockchain. And within the smart contract, you can define you know, whatever voting mechanism you need or want to actually permission different organizations onto the network. And you can also do things like allowing for changes of who's actually governing the network overall, who's operating the network. Uh, equally, you can decide you know, how to uh, blacklist or whitelist nodes, deactivate nodes that might be uh, you know, temporarily problematic. They may be inadvertently spamming the network for some, uh, you know, some technical reason. And so you can deactivate nodes through this process. And then additionally, we're introducing this idea of uh, granular role types. So what we've seen through our uh, experience with actually moving in, uh, Ethereum into production is that not every organization wants or needs the same level of access. A regulator node, for example, may only need read-only access to the network. And so what we're introducing is this notion of different role types. So one uh, entity may be able to submit transactions but not deploy smart contracts. Another entity may be able to deploy smart contracts whilst another one may, may only be able to read uh, the blockchain contents itself. As I said, this is coming in April, these last two features, which I think is going to be really important for some of the larger networks that we're seeing being, uh, being stood up. Another important piece from a, a permission blockchain perspective is consensus. So uh, the idea of using a proof of work or even proof of stake within permission blockchains is not really required. Uh, we have a different trust model in a permissioned environment. But what people do need typically is this notion of finality, finality of transactions. And uh, what we've seen is that actually uh, different use cases require or, or can benefit from different consensus algorithms. And so we have a, co a configurable consensus model within Quorum. So right now we have three consensus algorithms, proof of authority, which you know, many of you will be familiar with. We have a raft implementation and then we have a Byzantine fault tolerant implementation called Istanbul. Um, so just very quickly, uh, the way we think about POA is that it's probably ideal for proof of concepts, but given that it doesn't actually give you tr uh, finality guarantees, it's not really something that we're seeing used in production. Raft, on the other hand, is a, a fully crash fault tolerant consensus algorithm formally proved. This is actually based on the etcd uh, Raft implementation, which underpins things like Kubernetes. And so what we see is a very high throughput, low latency environment 
blocks are minted every 50 milliseconds uh, on demand, so you don't have a continuously growing chain. And um, we also obviously, as a result, see transaction finality because every node on the network basically progresses the blockchain at the same time. And then just very briefly on IBFT, as I said, Byzantine fault tolerance, um, it actually has a very nice scaling uh, characteristic. It scales very similarly to what you would see in public Ethereum. And again, importantly, it provides us with transaction finality. One of the um, providers uh, who effectively provide a, a sort of managed service for Quorum actually uh, told us that there's around 2,000 networks currently running, uh, 2,000 Quorum networks currently running IBFT. But it's not just uh, privacy, uh, performance, permissioning, different consensus algorithms that are needed from an enterprise perspective. There are a host of other requirements that need to be met. So from security to resiliency, uh, availability in different cloud environments, the ability to continuously test and integrate uh, you know, new changes, uh, being able to easily deploy software and also being able to monitor for failures. So we've done a lot of work in this space. Uh, on the security side of things, we have a full integration with Azure Key Vault and also with Hash, uh, HashiCorp Vault. And these are really important uh, in terms of the way that enterprises expect keys to be managed and the segregation of duties that is required, specifically from a cyber perspective. We've also, uh, off the back of that, decided to further separate out the enclave within the Tessera environment from the transaction manager. And really what this is gonna allow for is some sort of enclave as a service where you can really bring the, the enclave that you need for key management to the solution that, you, that you're currently de developing. In the same vein, we're uh, doing more work around API segregation that allows us to have better authentication of the, of the various API calls. And then finally, we're introducing uh, optionally the notion to have uh, gas costs. So gas is actually free on Quorum by default. There's no need to have ether to tr transact on a Quorum network. But in some of the larger networks, what we're seeing is people do actually want to have some way of incentivizing people to actually behave correctly and throttle uh, networks and transactions that are being committed to the chain. And so optionally, you can actually enable gas, or at least the gas price. <clears throat> On the resiliency front, very quickly, uh, we have automatic node recovery for the Tessera node. So if that goes down, uh, it can retrieve payloads from its peers. Keep in mind that the Tessera network is not really a blockchain, and so we've had to implement the recovery uh, separately for that. But what we do have as well with Tessera, given that it's a Java-based environment, is full support for typical block uh, uh, database schemes that you would like, or schemas that you would like, or, or, or providers. So H2, Oracle, SQLite, uh, for example. And then from a cloud perspective, uh, na uh, we have native support in Azure. Microsoft was actually one of the early providers of cloud availability or, or cloud provision for Quorum. Uh, there's a Quorum template that you can go on that can very easily spin up a blockchain network or uh, sp uh, set up a node. And SAP have recently done the same thing. Continuous testing is extremely important for any production implementation, right? So what we are using is the gauge framework, which is this really nice framework that allows you to very easily describe tests and write tests in a number of different languages that basically give us a full regression and acceptance testing framework. Every time there's a pull request made, the full uh, suite runs, and we run a daily, uh, a daily regression as well to ensure that any changes that we are making are not gonna be breaking existing production implementations. <coughs> Uh, on the deployment side, we've also developed something called Quorum Cloud, which basically makes it easier for you to deploy to different cloud environments, currently supporting AWS with additional cloud providers in the pipeline. We also have an official Docker image, which makes it obviously very easy to deploy uh, Quorum containers. And we're seeing support from some of these providers who are uh, you know, offering a managed type of service. So Kaleido and Blockdaemon, for example. <clears throat> and then finally, on the system uh, monitoring aspect, Full integration with Splunk. Uh, if you're familiar with Amber Data, who are you know, very prominent on the public blockchain side of things, uh, Amber Data also has native support for Quorum. And then we have quite nice tools built through Grafana that allow you to actually monitor the various states of the network. So how is that all being used? How is it all coming together? Well, uh, a host of companies, organizations, and startups are using Quorum. 
clearly JP Morgan is uh, a key user and we'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the details around some of the key production implementations that we have, specifically the interbank information network, also a debt issuance platform that we created and, and I'm sure you would have seen the news on JPM coin. But outside of JP Morgan, you know, we have large banks, we have central banks who are building with Quorum, we have a host of service providers, so you know, your top four uh, systems integrators, Accenture, EY, uh, clearly Microsoft is, is doing a lot of work uh, on Quorum as well. And from a startup's perspective, this is I think really exciting too because a lot of these startups are building services and tools for the public Ethereum blockchain, and they're all directly compatible with Quorum. And so this is really one of the advantages of having a fork of the public blockchain is that you just get to use a lot of the innovation um, or you get to basically uh, have access to a lot of the innovation that's taking place already. And just some brief stats in terms of uh, you know, how Quorum is being used. So 11,000 Docker pools and around 3,000 stars on GitHub with about uh, 25,000 monthly views. So let's talk about some use cases and actually deploying Quorum in a production environment. So the first one is the interbank information network. This is a network that's been formed by JP Morgan, uh, and the goal here is really to minimize friction in cross-border payments. There are about 170 banks signed up to this network, and th this was really born out of our um, analysis of the payments flow and how blockchain could be applied to daily payments. And what we realized was payments by themselves actually work fairly well, but when you look at cross-border payments, often what we saw was delays, you know, from a couple of days to a number of weeks, specifically related to the sanctions screening process. So if I'm making a payment to someone in, in another country, there's actually no way that that payment can go through directly. There has, it has to go through a series of correspondent banks. And effectively, you end up with this daisy chain of correspondent banks communicating this payment information to each other. Um, and what happens is if there is a sanctions flag that's being raised, either by the person who's making the payment or, or against the person who's receiving the payment, these, the payment effectively stops and each of these banks have to basically walk up uh, the chain to the bank prior to them to actually get the information that they need. There's no way to directly access uh, the, the end beneficiary or, or the remitter. And so what we've done is we've created a blockchain platform called IIN, and this effectively simplifies this entire process, moves it from a email and phone call based process uh, where you have these very fragmented communication channels to something that allows for a more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, model to exist. But in order to actually do this, clearly Quorum had to solve for a number of key requirements that these, these enterprises have. Firstly, privacy. We're talking about you know, people's names and addresses and, and uh, dates of birth, and um, that information can't live directly on, uh, on the blockchain. So we had to implement privacy using the Tessera model. Obviously, permissions is important. You have to make sure that only the banks that are part of this network can actually join the network. Um, and so uh, implementing that strong governance model was, was crucial. Performance, you know, we're dealing with uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions um, from a, a sanction screening process perspective. And so we want to make sure that we can actually meet the performance requirements. And this is where things like the raft uh, consensus algorithm come in. Security, again, really important from key management. And so this is where the integration with uh, Azure Key Vault and HashiCorp Vault became very important, providing that segregation of where the key lives versus um, who can actually interact with the node. And then obviously continuous integration testing for any production environment. Similar story for another uh, use case that we have. This one is not actually in production, but it's something that we, we are uh, currently working on quite closely. Uh, this is a debt issuance platform that we piloted last year with the National Bank of Canada. Uh, they issued a $150 million of debt uh, using a Yankee CD product with uh, investment from a number of global investors. And um, really what the platform here is here is a debt issuance and lifecycle management platform. And so what we have is the ability for issuers to issue debt tokens, banks uh, to issue cash tokens, uh, those to be exchanged atomically on chain, we have uh, within the smart contracts in the system, lifecycle management and pay down automatically built in, as well as a, a bidding and auction system uh, for the initial distribution. 
And um, actually, an interesting point here is, as I said, this was March last year that we modeled the, the cash tokens. And so, you know, when we, when we think about the work that we've done on JPM Coin, this was actually the genesis or one of the genesis um, projects for that because we recognized the need for having on-chain cash in order to actually support the system. From a requirements perspective, you know, very similar to IAN, um, this, it's important to have privacy implemented. You know, people cannot see investors, for example, shouldn't be able to see the price that another investor is paying or, or how much they're buying. Um, we should only be allowing accredited investors onto the platform or specific issuers. It's very important to have finality of transactions. You know, when you're making a bid for a particular uh, piece of debt, you don't want that to somehow be uh, usurped by some other mining process, for example. And the same uh, considerations around security and continuous integration. Not just JPM, you know, there's a number of other companies who are building on top of Quorum, moving into production. I'm not going to go through the details of all of these, but just to highlight, you know, across industries from commodities and trade finance and supply chain, uh, there's additional work happening in the payment space and KYC and national networks being built using Quorum. These companies are using uh, Quorum and more importantly using Ethereum within the enterprise because it enables them to actually put their business processes and transform their business processes using blockchain. An important point here as well is that when we think about uh, the requirements that these entities have and how that feeds into Quorum, Really, the, the roadmap that we have is community driven. So we have, from a Quorum team perspective, regular discussions with companies that are actually building on Quorum to take in their requirements to make sure that Quorum is actually meeting their needs. And uh, we have you know, daily dialogue with, with many organizations. Obviously, JP Morgan, uh, being one of the key users of Quorum, has um, you know, quite a, a heavy uh, impact in terms of the type of features that are being developed. Don't need to go through all of this, and, and the slides will be available, but, but very uh, you know, clearly we're looking at things across a number of key categories, uh, which are the ones we've discussed, privacy, permissioning, and performance, resiliency, scalability, interoperability with other platforms is extremely important for you know, the, the, the kind of future state of blockchain, and the tooling that, that uh, sits around Quorum as well. We are hiring, um, both on the engineering side and the product side, uh, as well as in the community space, so if you're looking to get involved in the exciting world of permission blockchains, speak to me afterwards. Um, and just to summarize you know, the, the, the messages here, firstly, going back to where we started, the magnitude of the enterprise space is, is significant, but I think an opportunity. And so when we, when we talk about scaling blockchains, we should be thinking about scaling for the scale of enterprise and the magnitude of enterprise. Permission blockchains provide a means of tackling these problems today. And I think that in the future, they may just end up being a proving ground uh, and an on-ramp into opportunities that can be really explored within the public space. I think that you will have a, a, a persistent state of permissioned and public blockchains, but I think some of it may end up transitioning. And then finally, Ethereum you know, is being deployed in enterprise, in production, via platforms like Quorum. And I think this is just a really positive thing for every, everyone here in terms of bringing you know, additional mindshare, growth, funding, et cetera, to the generalized Ethereum community. So feel free to reach out. If you want to learn more about Quorum, um, you can go onto the jpmorgan.com website. Quorum is 100% open sourced, and so uh, you can download the repo. We also have a, a very active and growing Slack. So uh, just use the bit.ly there, quorum-slack, um, and reach out. Thanks very much. What sort of POA check check? What sort of POA do you have which doesn't provide? Sorry. <clears throat> okay, I will shout. What sort of POA in a sense do you have which doesn't provide penalty? Both for clean and or as far as I know to provide it. Yeah, so it is uh, it's Obviously, Quorum being a Geth implementation just implements the same consensus uh, as you would have in Geth. Uh, the point is that in the other implementations where they are leader-based, the other nodes just automatically follow the transaction, or sorry, the, the votes that are being committed. Okay, so I think that that's a question that you often have. You can't hear me? Yeah, it's a bit soft. Uh, Basically, what's the difference between your solution and Hyperledger Fabric? Sorry, can you repeat? What's the difference between this and Hyperledger? 
the difference between Quorum and Hyperledger Fabric? Yep. So a number of key points. Um, firstly, from a privacy perspective, as I said, there's a single blockchain on the network. So when you think about Hyperledger Fabric, there is effectively, you know, they have the channels implementation, and that ultimately requires, or in, uh, what it leads to is multiple blockchains. So some of the challenges that I think the Fabric team are addressing, and by the way, JP Morgan is a, a, one of the founding members of Hyperledger, so uh, I think that when you think about permission blockchains in general, there are going to be a number of solutions. But what we've seen challenges with is uh, things like transacting across channels and ensuring privacy of channels. Also, the reliance on centralized ordering services to actually uh, provide that tr uh, transaction finality and privacy. Um, and then a, a very important point for all of us here is that Quorum is you know, based on Ethereum. And so we have direct compatibility with what is happening in the public Ethereum space. And so if you think about a future world where maybe these two things are closer together, every everything you build for a quorum network is directly compatible with the public Ethereum network and largely, that's largely true going the other way. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be a, a very important thing when we think about, you know, maybe these things are intranet, internet-like, maybe not, but having that interoperability between uh, a permissioned environment and a public blockchain environment I think is gonna be crucial. Hi. Um, right on, hello. Uh, are you looking into state channel technology already for scalability and privacy? Yeah, so the question was, are we looking into state channels? Um, so we try and stay abreast with all of the latest developments that are happening within the public blockchain. Actually, it's a, it's a little bit uh, unusual. If you think about the quorum design, in some sense it is. Uh, it does actually provide like a sharding uh, compatibility, which is slightly different, obviously, to, to state channels and what you're describing. But I think when we think about how you can go about scaling the network, Quorum doesn't, ha doesn't necessarily suffer from some of the same challenges that you have in public blockchains. <coughs> so whilst we're looking at it, and, and we will always look at the, the new technologies that are coming out and seeing how we can leverage them, we do actually, we are actually able to meet many of the requirements we have today just with the you know, layer one implementation. Hi. Um, uh, GEF is uh, GPL licensed, and uh, GPL is often a nightmare with legal and compliance departments. So how does it work with JP Morgan and uh, your partners like uh, Market? Yep. So the question was just around the license and uh, whether there are challenges with GPL. So JP Morgan is clearly using Quorum, um, and uh, we, are, we have to abide by all of the rules and, and uh, requirements around the license. GPL is actually fine to develop on as long as you're not uh, making changes to the core code base. So you can develop applications that sit on top of a GPL implementation and not have any concerns or, or, or uh, yeah, concerns around having to commit your code, to, you know, make it publicly available. And actually the services that we have developed around Quorum, um, so the Constellation and Tessera environment, those are actually Apache licensed. Um, the Tessera, sorry, the uh, ZSL implementation from Zcash also is not GPL licensed. So you can have a whole host of applications and services built around Quorum, which don't require you to give up any of your proprietary code base. But I think actually, principally, it's very important to have a, uh, a blockchain implementation that is not going to be kind of taken away from you and monetized and you don't get access to all of the, the features that are being developed. And so we think it's really important that when people are building on top of Quorum uh, that, and actually contributing to Quorum, that, that everyone should benefit from that in the same way that everyone benefits from changes going into the public Ethereum space. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, regarding ZSL, when will it be uh, product ready? I think that the POC was submitted one year ago. And the second one is, uh, is there any plans by JP Morgan to support uh, cracks uh, in replacement of uh, Tessera? I think they handle differently the, the, the way they, uh, the, the cracks nodes are communicating. Yeah, yep. sorry, just quickly, was the first question around the timing of ZSL? I, I didn't quite catch what your first question was on ZSL. Uh, Okay, so the question is when will the ZSL implementation be productionized? So we're actually uh, continuously looking at additional and new implementations of zero knowledge. Our plan is for 
this year to have a strong production implementation, but really it's largely dependent on the work that is happening elsewhere. So we have a small uh, cryptography team internally, but we are going to be looking to uh, continue you know, partnerships with additional play players externally. And so I think part of it is just around what is happening outside. Clearly, clearly there's a lot of change. Um, that is taking place, and so we want to make sure that we're able to you know, really leverage that and, and implement the, the correct solution. Uh, and then the second question was around Crux. Uh, so Crux is you know, fully compatible. We, we uh, know the developer of Crux um, very well, and I think it really just comes down to choice. So Crux being written in Go, Tessera being written in Java, Constellation being written in Haskell, there is no reason uh, or requirement to use one or the other. You can really use what you would like. Uh, and so if you want to spin up a quorum network using Crux, then you, know, you should be able to do that. And I think, it's an, I think it's an important point because what we do want to enable is the development of additional services around quorum. And I think Crux is, a, is actually a really good example of that. Cool, thank you very much. <laughs>